Good morning and a very warm welcome from the team here at Impact Hub Geneva in Lausanne. We are delighted to have you this morning for the live conversation about changing the system through collective action and leadership with Paul Polman. This is organized as part of the Entrepreneurship Academy 2021 edition. Now, in order for this webcast to go smoothly, I would kindly invite you to keep your camera as well as your microphone shut off, but also kindly take a moment to rename yourself to reflect your name and your organization so that we may see who is in this room and also take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat to make this virtual space a little bit more friendly. Before we get started, I'd like to ask you a question. So we'll be launching a poll here so that we can dive straight into the topic. The question is, what is your experience with entrepreneurship? And we'll look at the results later. So just take a moment to write your answer and we will discover your answers in a moment. Now, moving on swiftly, I would like to introduce Santu Boetius, co-founder of Impact Hub Geneva and Lausanne. She will tell us a little bit more about the work that we do here before we move over to our distinguished guest, Paul Polman. <laughs> over to you, Santu. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Erica, and good morning, all of you. I'm uh, really honored here to, to be with you this morning and uh, with Paul, and particularly on this very important topic on collective action and leadership for uh, systems change. And um, yeah, well, prior, prior to this session, uh, I listened to one of Paul Pullman's presentations at Stanford University some five years ago uh, on pursuing uh, our purpose. And uh, he really gave an in-depth analysis of the current situation and how our current system uh, indeed has taken millions of people out of poverty in the last few years, but at the same time, it's still failing us and it's leaving people behind, nature, animals, uh, the planet, and, uh, and these topics five years ago are very much very relevant today. So at the same time, Paul was also speaking positively and particularly about the adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals in 2015 and the key role of business and the next generations of leaders to drive forward this change. So I'm really excited that this is the topic we'll be speaking about. And, uh, and also I'm excited about that this is really like the core of the work that we do uh, with Impact Hub Geneva. Uh, we, can, we can turn into the next slide. Um, please, uh, slide number three. Yes, great. So at Impact Hub Geneva, our motto is that impact doesn't happen in isolation. It requires collective effort. And we do know that our situation right now is, is urgent on the planet and that we each and every one of us do need to step up into, into taking action uh, so that we can make this planet work for everyone and all of us. So um, we see ourselves at the Impact Hub really as, as the, trans, the ones that are uh, supporting people, innovators, entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs in this transition from the parts of the old system that are no longer functioning and transforming them to a system that functions for all. And so to achieve this, what we do is that we support entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs, students, uh, people uh, in the public sector, private sector organizations to realize their potential and particularly to bring forward sustainable solutions to some of these key challenges. And uh, to just give you a little uh, example of what this means in practice, um, you can go over uh, to the next slide. So at Impact Hub, so um, yes, thank you. We're part of a global network of more than 100 Impact Hubs across the world. And this allows us to really work at change and work at the systems level. And, uh, and this is very unique. So thus uh, us in Geneva as running the Impact Hub just by the train station uh, down the road, and many of you have been, 
uh, been at the hub, uh, we have this access to a global network across the world of innovators, entrepreneurs that are all working towards the same mission. Uh, and I will go into the next slide. So a few examples of, uh, no, following slide. Mm -hmm. So a few examples. Um, being based uh, in Geneva, close to the UN, UN, we did realize that the SDGs is really the key framework for, for the work that we do. And, um, and, but we realized that back in 2015, we really had the big business and governments jumping on the SDG agenda. However, entrepreneurs had not really been brought into, into the mix and particularly ones from emerging economies that do have a huge potential to really contribute to the change that we need to see. So, uh, so a few years ago, we launched Accelerate 2030, which is now today the largest program in the world supporting impact-driven entrepreneurs from, uh, from uh, the global south to scale their impact on the sustainable development goals. And so today we have uh, run the program in over 26 countries across Africa, Asia, Latin America, and Eastern Europe supporting hundreds of entrepreneurs having an impact on millions of people across the world. And actually right now, uh, we are launching the program in a number of countries. And, uh, and uh, so we're inviting entrepreneurs and partners uh, to join. And you can please, uh, yeah, you can see more information on our, on our website. But right now we have, uh, we have uh, in June, we will be launching the program, the fourth edition of the program in 21 countries. So we invite you all to be part of this bigger mission together with us. And um, going on to the next slide, a little example of what we do in Switzerland. Uh, we looked at the situation in Switzerland and saw that, uh, realized that if we wanna have an impact on the SDGs, it's really uh, where it comes down to <laughs> responsible consumption and production. Switzerland is uh, one of the largest, uh, we have one of the largest uh, amount of waste in, uh, in, in the whole world. And yes, if everyone lived like we do in Switzerland, we would require at least three planets. So uh, we launched an initiative uh, and now in six different cities in, uh, in uh, Switzerland, in Bern, Basel, Geneva, Lausanne, Lugano, Zurich, and uh, together with Sanudu uh, Revalitas and with the support of MAVA Foundation, where our aim is to accelerate the transition of Switzerland to a circular economy. And here again, because we're always thinking in terms of systems, we decided to have an initiative that really looks at different types of pillars of the economy. So we're working with businesses through business, lab, business labs for SMEs and corporates. We do a, run a number of community building activities uh, within different specific, uh, uh, specific themes around circular economy. We do research and policy recommendations so that we can change policy. And last but not least, we do a number of work with startups, particularly uh, early stage startups, but also scale ups uh, through the Kickstart initiative. So uh, one of our key programs and also one that we'd like to, to put on the map right now because the, um, the, uh, we having, um, the program is, is closing in a few days. We are applying, we're, we have an open call for applications for scale ups that are focusing on circle economy. And uh, we connect scale-ups with large corporates in Switzerland to develop so-called proof of concepts and work together on sustainable projects. And have, we have today uh, facilitated over 170 partnerships and over 190 startups in scaling uh, in Switzerland and throughout this program. So with this said, this is, uh, this is some of the work we do, but particularly for our event today here, uh, we are excited about uh, the launch of our, our uh, big initiative, uh, the Entrepreneurship Academy, that will be launching in uh, September uh, this year. And I want to give over the word to, to Erica, who is running the Entrepreneurship Academy, to share with us a little bit on what, what the Academy is and within this framework, uh, why uh, that Paul is here today to join us within this framework of the Academy. So. Over to you, Erica. Thank you. Thank you so much, Santu. Yes, indeed. I would love to tell you a little bit more about the Entrepreneurship Academy. But before, let's have a look at the poll results. That way, we'll see how familiar we all are here with the topic. OK, so we have quite an equal split between the four answers. So that's, that's great. Um, let me tell you a little bit more. 
So the Entrepreneurship Academy is a unique cross industry, so cross sector professional development program for young professionals and leaders aiming for business model innovation to serve people, planet and profit. Our approach is based on four key pillars. These are the four elements that we believe um, constitute entrepreneurship and it begins with entrepreneurship. So being able to create a viable uh, business model. Innovation is the second pillar. So being able to engage stakeholders to come up with truly novel uh, solutions to complex challenges. Collaboration, because it's absolutely essential to do this um, together, to do this in, in collaboration, really transcending boundaries. And finally, leadership, which is an essential part of each of these pillars, because in order to step up to our higher purpose to do something that we have never done before, we have to overcome our own uh, limitations and boundaries. The Entrepreneurship Academy will be launching its second edition in September, so definitely stay tuned to hear more about that. And an important part of the Academy is that participants really get the opportunity to meet inspiring entrepreneurs and intrapreneurs during the program so that they can see living examples of how to have this kind of impact. And this is why today we are honored to host Paul Polman. Paul is co-founder and co-chair of Imagine. He is the former CEO of Unilever, and he is an advocate of business as a force for good. Good morning, Paul. How are you this morning? Good morning to both of you. Can you hear me OK? Yes. yes. Perfect. Well, thanks for the opportunity. And good to see you both again, uh, Santu and Erika. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Yes, so we uh, we all have a chance now to have a, a conversation with Paul, uh, as you know, for the next so for the next half an hour, and uh, followed by some Q and A. We have collected some of your questions uh, that you posted, and also we will collect some more questions that are in the chat. So feel free if you get inspired by some of the here to to share your thoughts and ideas, but also to to post your questions. Um, I'd like to, however, start Paul. Um, I um, we 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 know you're a very inspiring person, and uh, many of us already know a lot about your background. But I'd like to ask with a bit of a personal question to to understand uh, from you, what would you say that for you was really the pivotal moment that made you you know your wake up call, or maybe your inspiration in life that made you take this step and very courageous step into um, into taking action. Uh, we believe at the hub that a lot that each and one of us have this you know we do feel a call at some point in our life and and many of us uh are sometimes wondering like you know is it really my role to step up to the game or not and therefore we'd like to hear from you what what has been your personal journey what made you take this step and maybe some of the personal challenges and doubts that you've had um but in order for this you've come to to uh, inspire millions so please share with us well, thank you, Santu, and I have to compliment you all that you're up so early. I'm actually in the UK, so it's uh, eight o'clock in the morning here, and you all starting in Geneva at nine. It's uh, on a Monday morning. It's quite something. It's actually a holiday here, so I'm glad I could uh, fit it in. But I wish I was in Geneva and uh, and enjoy the beautiful city there. You know, there there isn't really one moment, in my opinion. Your life gets formed continuously, and you will do that until you move to a another hopefully better place and uh, so it's it's about crucibles all along and there are different needs at different points in time that you have uh, when you're young you need to be taken care of when you have a family you need to take care of a family when you get into a more comfortable position you might be uh, freeing up significant time to uh, take care of others there are different parts of your life i think that form you and uh, and will continuously do that. So I call them uh, crucibles. I was actually, um, I grew up in the 60s more or less. And uh, 
a lot of the values that I have, I really thank my parents for that. Uh, just after World War II, their main objective was to have lasting peace in Europe, uh, helping their communities recuperate, be sure that their children could get education because it was deprived from them because of the war itself. So they were really people that put themselves to the interest of others and wanted to create this lasting uh, environment of, of, of peace and justice, of inclusion, if you want to. And then I grew up in the 60s, as I mentioned, that was the time of the Vietnam War, of flower power, of Biafra, which is uh, eastern Nigeria, the terrible droughts and the images on television still, uh, still stick with me. In 1970, we had the first Earth Day, uh, Silent Spring, uh, Rachel Carlson had, had written this book in uh, 1962 already, but uh, on the limits of planetary boundaries, the, the uh, chemical industry was our main focus at that time, but uh, limited awareness and she should be credited with raising it. And then I was fortunate enough to be in Rio, um, which uh, Rio plus 20, which was in 2012. Um, we created the World Business Council for sustainable development located in Geneva, by the way, not far from you. And I was uh, fortunate to chair that for four years. And these are all things that I think make uh, make your life actually uh, what it is today. And, and first and foremost, the values you have, the values of uh, dignity and respect for everybody, uh, fighting for equity, having a high degree of uh, compassion. And during your life, you have different, uh, what I would call uh, crucibles. Uh, when I moved to Newcastle in the 90s, it was actually the first time in my life that I saw second generation unemployed, uh, children who had never seen their fathers work, the shipbuilding, the steel, the coal had all gone belly up. And the only thing a 14 or 15 year old girl could get was a baby and uh, making her situation worse actually by doing so. But uh, I got involved very heavily in, in the communities there and the community activity because we simply were the biggest employer and I felt we had that obligation to do something about it. And then uh, I had the opportunity when I retired from PNG in uh, 2005 uh, in Geneva, which actually brought me to Geneva at that time um, to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. I had a blind friend in, in the US and when he called me, Eric Weyenmeyer was his name or is his name. And when he called me, we decided to take blind people from all parts of the world. So we climbed Kilimanjaro with eight blind people and it completely changed my mindset towards disability. All they saw was possibility. And we visited these blind schools in Arusha and Moshi and all the cities around there. And that made me start the Kilimanjaro Blind F uh, Trust, which my wife and I started and now has 26,000 children in East Africa in school that are visually impaired. Then I was in Mumbai where the terrorist attack came. And uh, unfortunately we were there uh, during this terrible ordeal that many people lost their lives. We were lucky this time but I realized the value of life, but also the goodness of people, but also that many of these things of hate, of injustice, of violence are basically uh, driven by poverty and by exclusion. And probably my biggest formation was when Secretary General uh, at that time Ban Ki-moon uh, asked me to be part of the high level panel to develop the sustainable development goals. Um, it was far more work than I had anticipated, but I don't regret a, a minute of it. We listened to all parts of society and all different interest groups from the youth to the handicapped, to the farmers, to the to to many different people from indigenous people, many different people from all parts of, of life. And uh, it was an enormous learning experience, probably drinking from the fire hose. And then I saw this potential of developing this global agenda that you now have with your accelerator program and many other things uh, at the heart of, of why you're there. Uh, and it allowed me to put it at the heart of Unilever as well and turn that into an enormous business opportunity and a competitive advantage. So these are all these things that talk, that uh, teach you that, uh, you know, you might have passion in life, which is really about finding yourself, but ultimately it's about purpose, which is about losing yourself to the surface of others. And I've discovered, uh, you know, the more I'm around, how lucky I've been and how I'm fortunate enough to be in a position to uh, do things for others and, and hopefully make this a better world for all. So a long answer to a short question, but that's basically how we continue to get formed.
Thank you. Thank you so much. And, uh, and I think um, many of us can, can resonate on, you know, situations that we've had in our lives that, that makes us tick. And, and, and I, I think, um, yeah, the, the crucial part is here is that, that we can uh, support each other to actually take up this step. You've been, you've been lucky on many ways, but you have also been courageous and we'll be having some questions around, around uh, courage and the, the role and the importance of courage uh, in leadership and uh, in, uh, in each of us in moving forward. But before that, I'd, I'd like to uh, give over to, to Erica. Thank you, Santu. I'd like to follow up with a question surrounding business. So we know that the economic system for business today is, is unsustainable, but we also know that business has demonstrated it can transform certain, certain models and become regenerative. Can you tell us about your vision of net positive? What is, about, what is it? Uh, I understand you, are, uh, you have a new book about this topic. Yeah, we can talk about that. In fact, I have a book indeed, um, uh, Erica, that comes out in September, which I call Net Positive, How Companies Thrive by Giving More Than They Take. And it's very clear that um, COVID is a good reminder that our current economic system isn't healthy. If we don't take people and planet into account, it's not going to function. We're leaving too many people behind and we're destroying the planetary boundaries. And uh, the costs have been enormous. If you look at COVID, $16 trillion has been spent to date by governments just to save lives and livelihoods. It's much more to be spent to get out of it. Um, the uh, economy itself has lost about $22 trillion in, in GDP. Uh, it really has put us back probably 15 to 20 years on the development agenda. And yet the implementation of the sustainable development goals only require an incremental three to $5 trillion a year. We're at the point right now that the cost of inaction is significantly higher than the cost of action. And there are enormous opportunities. You know, if just, just look what we've done in a, in a nutshell, 78% um, of our biodiversity has been lost over the last five decades. People call up the sixth greatest extinction. We've cut half of the world's rainforests. Climate change is still projecting, even today, to well above two and a half degrees. Um, so we need to bend that curve. And likewise on inequality, we've not done very well. Uh, we still have 4.2 billion people in this world living on less than $5 a day. Much of the wealth creation that has happened has only been amassed by about 10% of the world's population. And COVID has put about 150 million people back in absolute poverty. So if you just take last year alone, just to share with you one statistic, uh, the workers of this world, if you want to, that are vital for the functioning of this world, lost a combined uh, wealth of $3.7 trillion. The billionaires, just the billionaires in this world, gained an additional $3.9 trillion, enough to give everybody vaccines to let the 242 million children that are not in school give them education, to avoid the 800 million people that still go to bed hungry every night, avoid them going to bed hungry by providing food. So the system is really stacked against us and, and we need to change that. And net positive is really uh, talking about what companies need to do. We cannot solve these worldly problems if the private sector doesn't get involved. You know, the private sector is about 60% uh, of the global economy, 80% uh, of the financial flow, 90% of the job creation. So it is vital, it's absolutely vital that they play a key role. And we all know that business cannot really be successful themselves either if these uh, societies fail, nor do I feel that they can be bystanders in a system that gives them life or permission to exist in the first place. So the book about net positive is really what we need to do. Uh, uh, mentioning that shareholder primacy has come to an end, uh, mentioning that CSR is not enough anymore. If you look at CSR, corporate social responsibility, it's about being less bad, it's about risk management. But what you really need to move to is a uh, from CSR to what I call RSC, responsible social corporations. Corporations that run their businesses for the long term, that take full responsibility of their total handprint in society, which means not only scope one and two, like most companies do at best, but also scope three, four, and actually five, as we will talk in the book. It needs to be a model of multi-stakeholder. You cannot just work 
in terms of optimizing shareholder value that has come to an end you really need to uh, optimize the value for all of your stakeholders purpose at its core it's very clear and then uh, participating in the more transformative changes of society if a company doesn't focus on changing the world in their own sphere of influence for the better uh, it will ultimately not be uh, accepted to be around so that's really a net positive company the book talks a little bit about the unilever journey what we were trying to do there what we're still trying to do why it is difficult it gives uh, as much insights into the human transformation that we need the uh, inner core or what you might call the leadership journey as well as what companies need to do and then i don't hesitate at the end of the book to talk about some of the tougher issues of paying tax of corruption of uh, CEO compensation, uh, some of these issues that are fundamentally wrong in society that could be solved today if we had the courage to do so. And uh, ultimately, my goal is that everybody reads it, doesn't only get more courage to do more, but also has some ideas in the book to start uh, going on this uh, journey, which is not an easy journey. If it was that easy, someone would have done it before us but it requires the leaders uh, that uh, we're obviously talking to today. That's one of the main reasons I'm here. So we're talking about a radically, uh, a radical change in the mindset under which businesses operate. I can understand how complex that can be. Can you share, Paul, an aha moment, a specific time in your career, perhaps in, in, in Unilever when you were operating this large scale transformation that helped you understand better how this is done, how systems change can effectively occur? Well, actually, uh, here again, and it might lead into why I created Imagine. But the first thing is the first thing is when I joined Unilever, the company was not in very good shape. It had fallen victim to shareholder primacy. The results were not coming in. It had seen its turnover go down from uh, a little bit over 50 billion to 38 billion. It was basically in the business of selling selling businesses and, and really not not good. That's why for the first time they took a CEO coming in from the outside and uh, they chose me. I, I don't, uh, you know, there undoubtedly were better people, but I ended up there. And what was attractive to me was um, when I went into the company, uh, I discovered obviously fairly quickly that um, I could not demand respect for pe from people. I had to earn the respect. And there was obviously a significant doubt in the company of why do we need to get someone in from from the outside and certainly someone who has worked for png and nestle are we bringing in the enemy and and can we do it ourselves so i studied very hard the history of the company i figured if i know it a little bit better than the others perhaps that is a first step towards gaining respect and there's something in the book of jim collins from good to great which talks about nurturing the core before you stimulate progress. So I went back to the roots of the company. Many of these companies have, have been created not for shareholders, but because of entrepreneurs, uh, ultimately in the beginning, that had a passion. You know, in the case of Lord Lever, his passion was to solve the issues in Victorian Britain of hygiene, what he called to make hygiene commonplace. He also had other objectives to lighten the how to housewives loads, but he created a business model that he called at that time shared prosperity. The man very much believed in a multi-stakeholder model. He built houses for his workers before, um, before the factories were fully built. He guaranteed them six day work weeks and, and wages, which was very unusual at that time, pension plans. He built schools and hospitals. And, uh, you know, even during World War I, they had the highest level of volunteers because he guaranteed their wages and their jobs back, to be honest. Uh, and that obviously was very uh, encouraging for people who wanted to fight for their country. So this man was quite unusual when he went to the House of Lords. Um, he was the only one, even until now, who took on the name of his wife. Uh, that shows you also how he thought about gender and gender equality. So anyway, I went back to these roots and that was a big aha to me because when I read about his shared prosperity and his vision, I said, you know, this company has so many great values. And when you change a company, Jim Collins talks about nurturing the core before you stimulate progress. Uh, and nurturing this core values that he had created was basically what we brought back to Unilever. And many of these brands that he created had these values embedded in them. But over the years, we were 
we just simply forgotten about them. You take a brand like Lifebuoy that when I came into the company was about to be discontinued, an old steel brand only in India. We can't really make that global. Well, the brand was called Lifebuoy, which is one of these, you know, rescue things you throw to people when they drown in the water. And uh, we changed the brand and positioned it simply as, as helping a child reach the age of five by teaching hand washing all across the world. We've reached a billion people improving their hygiene over these 10 years. And the brand, not surprisingly, has, has grown double digit every year. So I saw the power of bringing these values back and, 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 and making clear what the reason for business was. And that is obviously uh, very, very uh, encouraging. What I also saw during the 10 years uh, that I was CEO in Unilever is the limitations of companies to do something about it. I saw the breakdown of, of global cooperation and of global governance in nearly every country in the world. So that made me think about moving one step further. As a CEO, you might have board authority or you might have formal authority, which is the hierarchy of your organization. But I've always felt that you can do significantly more if you have the moral authority. And CEOs can only do so much. They're being seen as competitors. The trust with society is relatively low. Uh, for them to move to these bigger changes that need to really be tackled, these broader systems changes, they're not really equipped. They don't have the time or the knowledge or the resources. So that's why I created a platform now, which is called Imagine, which is a neutral platform, a foundation structure, where I bring a critical mass of CEOs across a value chain together um, uh, by industry to drive the broader systems changes. No company alone can get rid of plastics in the oceans or move to regenerative agriculture or really, frankly, implement fully the Paris agreements to stay net zero by 2050. But collectively, we can actually create critical mass that if you then work with society, civil society and governments, you can drive systems changes. And ultimately, it is about systems changes. Uh, Rutger Brackman in the Netherlands wrote a book called uh, Humankind which talks about the goodness of human beings, that we all have a little diamond inside of ourselves that we can make shine. But unfortunately, collectively, we're not behaving like that. Collectively, we are, it looks at times self-serving, uh, climate change, inequality, uh, it just keeps going and we never seem to address these issues. Some of them are getting worse. And the reason for that is not that we are bad human beings. No CEO wants more climate change. No CEO wants more people going to bed hungry. No CEO wants more unemployment. And um, the reason that we collectively behave like that is because of the boundaries that are put upon us. And as a result, you see many playing not to lose versus playing to win. Um, uh, many playing within a system that then pushes back. So you only get incrementalism versus step changes. So what we now need to focus on, despite the short termism in politics, the short termism in in, in the private sector, if you want to, is to move these boundaries to change behaviors. In Unilever, when I came in, I stopped giving quarterly reporting, I stopped giving guidance, I moved my compensation system to the longer term, and I did that as of day one. And the reason I did that was actually to provide that space to change that behavior. So that is what we're doing with Imagine. How do you get uh, measure environmental and social capital? That would be a change drive a change in behavior? How do you move a financial market to the longer term as a change in behavior? How do you ensure that you reward labor and not only capital, which is the problem of inequality and change structures to do that? And this is what we do collectively and it's great fun. And what I discover is that we can actually make more difference now at a bigger scale than I could when I was the CEO of Unilever. And I'll talk about some examples later if, if we have time. Thank you so much. I'm really glad you brought up Imagine because I was going to ask you about what your vision was with Imagine. So now I'll ask you a quick little question. Um, what's your antidote to greenwashing? Should fast moving consumer goods still exist? Well, if, if they should exist or not, they have a purpose, obviously. If you don't have all these great products that fast moving consumer goods uh, companies provide, if they provide it responsibly, uh, the world would not be a good place. I've often said that uh, countries where brands are available and can freely compete with themselves 
happen to have better economies as well and less people in poverty. So I'm proud to have run Unilever and provide the hygiene and, and well-being to over billions of people. I'm proud to provide them with the needed nutrition and food or oral care. You know, 80% of the kids missing out on school is for oral care issues. So these brands, if you do it responsibly, sustainably, equitably, then these companies are very good companies. But your question gets to the heart of it, indeed. It is, um, you know, you need to, to avoid that uh, you get the free riders, that uh, you get the claims that confuse consumers, uh, that you operate under standards that are truly to be trusted and high. And for that, you need transparency because transparency builds that trust. And the good thing is that we're now seeing uh, significant efforts happening globally to, to ask companies for more disclosure. The IFRS, which is a standard setting body globally, is working on a sustainable standard board. So we're very actively working with them to ensure that we get a broader reporting that not only is financial reporting, like is the case now, but also social and environmental reporting. Companies reporting on diversity, on pay scale differences, on human rights in the value chain. Uh, for example, all these companies that now already report that tend to be better. So can we make these standards? We've seen in Europe with the European Green Deal and the taxonomy that there are now standards coming in, for example, on ESG. Every financial institution has seen the power of ESG. Your generations being more purpose-driven, wanting to invest in more responsible uh, investments. So instead of just labeling everything ESG, the European government now, uh, the European uh, uh, Union now has set um, standards of what that ESG should look like. So you do need companies to lead it. You, knew, you do need these broader uh, measures of success, but then you also need to embed them in policies and frameworks to ensure you don't get the free riders and, and all that. The main ob obstacle of the financial market to move funds faster towards the sustainable development goals has actually been a lack of transparency, a lack of ability to compare companies, to see what is really happening, to understand fully the impact. And I think some of these measures I talked about will go into that direction to help us make more intelligent choices in that respect. Thank you so much. Having looked at the, the individual now, the organization and system, we're going to link it back to a uh, question about the in, uh, individual. Santu, you want to finish with that one before we go over to the audience Q&A? Yeah, I kind of wanted to tie it all together in, in that sense that, you know, you, you begin by sharing your personal journey and, and what have been some of the aha moments throughout your life. And then we're moving on to these major systems that need to change and, and how you're bringing CEOs together for this change. Um, being joined here in the call now with many aspiring entrepreneurs, some entrepreneurs, um, future business leaders, students, and others. Um, what's your, I'm just thinking very often we feel like one, one, one reason for our apathy is, is sometimes that the things and the systems feels too big. Climate change feels too big for me as a one individual to know like, what can I actually, what is the difference I can make? And I try to make small changes in our world, but how I consume and my work, et cetera. And I'm, I'm wondering what, what's, what would be your, your wise words to the future leaders of how we can feel that we are really contributing to that system, how we feel we are connected and, and what's like really tangible ways of moving forward that we are actually contributing to a systems change and not in, in silos. Um, yeah, just tying it all together. I'd like to hear, hear what you have to say about this topic. Well, it is, it is overwhelming. You, um, uh, the issues in the world are complex. You know, you probably also, when you were young, played with these balloons that you put water in it and you threw it at each other and waited for the balloon to explode. But if you had these balloons in your hand and you tried to squeeze them, you know, you never could get your hands around it. It always felt like it was popping up somewhere else again. And it's the same with these world issues, the issues of water, of climate change, of inequality, uh, food security. Anytime you try to you know, work on one issue, it seems to pop up another issue somewhere else again. So it is a very complex. The systems changes that we need are very complex. I've always operated under the principle is um, operate within your sphere of influence and try to do that with, with purpose, with passion, with positive attitude, and your sphere of influence grows. We all have an important role to play and collectively it adds up. 
if we all drink tea, we can take one attitude. We can say, oh, it doesn't matter because there are billions of people drinking tea every day and whatever I want is not going to make a difference. Or you can say, I want sustainable tea and better conditions for people in the tea plantations. And if I make sure that everybody who drinks tea wants it, you have a movement for change. So it starts with individuals before you have movements. Any major thing in, in the history of mankind has always done by individuals. So it starts with your own lifestyle, where there are a million things you can do. I even see it with myself every day and, and COVID has made us think as well and flying less will definitely be on my top priority of my list. But there are many other things we can do uh, within our own circle of living a more sustainable life, of taking care of goal number 12 that you have on responsible consumption, for example, in circular economy in Switzerland that, that you highlighted as one of the key priorities. And then the second thing is influence where you are. Major companies are now being changed by their employees. Sure, the financial market is starting and, and making noise. Uh, sure, their uh, governments are moving into some of these directions, but it is really employees that threaten to walk out, that are not wanting to work for companies anymore. Uh, the difference between high and low engagement scores is a responsible management and, and a responsible CEO of and more than anything else. So uh, don't underestimate the uh, that you can do uh, in the companies itself and don't estimate what you can do at the political level. You have to go out there and vote. I believe that in the US now, it swung to the, the, this direction with uh, Joe Biden, which is a big difference versus where we were before with the previous president. I forgot his name, but it was because of, of young people basically going to the polls. So you have many different things, not least your own purchasing power to decide what you buy, where you invest in. I don't believe, for example, myself yet that the financial market in general are so purpose driven, but the reason that they jump now on the sustainable development goals and ESG investing is only two things. The first one is they're seeing that they can get a higher return, so that's good. But they also see that the younger generation wants to put all their money there. And that's where the wealth is going. You know, we, we are going to pass on to some extent to, to all of these generations. So if you look at the major things in history, once more, they're changed by individuals. And if I just go into the last uh, two or three weeks, it were individuals that sued Exxon Mobil and forced different shareholders on that uh, on that board. This is a, a president never seen before. It were individuals that sued Shell and told them that they had to have a 45% emission reduction last week by 2030. And the co company, like so many others, were sort of complacently talking about 2050 and carbon capture storage and finding other excuses that on paper look great, but in practice, you know, you never get there and certainly not enough for what the world needs. So any change that we now see in society is because there's a greater Thornburn or another person behind it. And they're at all levels of society. So you can make a difference. The moment you believe that you cannot make a difference, that's then it's nearly not worth living anymore because we are all here to make this world a better place. We're all here to uh, positively influence others. And this is why your group is so powerful that you've created these impact hubs. And, and, you know, the word impact is very important, but it's driven by individuals like yourselves, obviously like Erica and many others. And uh, that is true for each and everyone, wherever we are in life. Many thanks for your answer, Paul. We'll now swiftly jump to the um, questions from the audience. We have a lot of very, a fascinating question, so we'll try to get through as many as we can. The first one from Louise Legat, founder and CEO of Positive Energy Leaders. She asks, what is the biggest inner shift do you see that leaders need to make within themselves to be successful in this transition? Uh, Louise, that's a very good question, and I don't know if there is one answer that would be oversimplifying it, but, but um, um, compassion. Uh, would be a very big word for me. You know, the, the, the moment that you become a true leader perhaps is the moment you realize that it's not about yourself. When you realize that investing in others to make them better ultimately also makes you better, is quite a revelation. The Dalai Lama said it very well when he said that if you seek enlightenment just for yourself to enhance your causes, you miss purpose. But if you seek enlightenment to help others achieve their causes, you have you live a life with purpose. So it's that notion that uh, investing in the greater common good is actually also to your own benefit. 
cannot survive no. if, we want to, if we not all collectively survive. That includes the planet. Thank you. Now to a more organizational question from Catherine Foster, fellow at Social, Social Alpha Foundation. What collaborative scaling mechanisms like certifications, data platforms, partnership frameworks, etc., are most important for circular? Oh, that's a question I, I really would be uh, not qualified to answer because uh, you know there are obviously many of these platforms, and I, I don't want don't want to say that we were one of the founding members of the Ellen MacArthur uh, Circular Economy work, and uh, obviously the Ellen MacArthur Foundation is is one of the leaders in driving to a circular economy. But, but without avoiding the question, may may I slightly deviate the question to a different direction? Um, which is really um, last year Earth Overshoot Day was August 22nd, which means that that's the day that the world uses as many resources at this, as it can replenish. So beyond that day, we're actually stealing from future generations. So a circular concept is very important. There's no question about it. That is a, but it's a starting point. If we don't move quite urgently from circular i.e. making it less bad. Circular is like right now only 9% uh, of the materials we use get reused in this world, which is absolutely biz bizarre if you think about it. Um, so we need to get that number up. That's what circular is. But with Earth Overshoot Day being August 22nd, we need to go to regenerative, restorative, re restorative thinking. If you want to. And this is what the book Net Positive uh, is talking about. So circular, one step certainly worth it but start thinking regenerative restorative if you want to and the best platforms that you have for that is the platforms where um, because at the end of the day the currency that we work with that guarantees success is called trust there's nothing else mm -hmm. if trust is high people will work together better and trust comes from a clear understanding of what the joint uh, uh, aligned objectives are uh, who does what operating with transparency, holding each other accountable. So if you have these elements, then many of any of these platforms, I think, could be successful. And we need many of the platforms because the the scale of the issues and, and the size of the world is big. So I don't want to uh, boil it down to a simple one if you want to. Right. So the, the human factor, the social innovation is as important oh, as any so other. <laughs> Uh, type of innovation. Yeah, we actually have a question that speaks about regenerative economy from Derek Q from Stock Alpha Q Analytics. He says, since leaving Unilever, what are the three actions you have witnessed within our system which gives you hope that we are on an improved So there, there is some um, uh, there was some background noise. Uh, Erica, you need to unmute yourself now so that you can continue. Okay. I will, I will repeat the I question. I think you have to repeat. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Since leaving Unilever, what are the three actions you have witnessed within our system, which gives you hope that we are an improved path to a more inclusive and regenerative economy? Oh, and now, uh, Paul, you're also muted. We're all muted, but I, I have a <laughs> question, uh, Erica, and that's a good one. I think um, COVID has shown us uh, a few things, that you cannot have healthy people on an unhealthy planet, and COVID has shown us the interrelationship, for example, between biodiversity, human health, the economy, climate change, the racial dimension with the tragic death of George Floyd. Uh, it has also shown us how quickly we can react uh, together if we have uh, a major crisis of this magnitude. And climate change would certainly not be of a lesser level, different, but of a lesser level than COVID. In fact, COVID is a direct result of us destroying our planetary boundaries. So there are many revelations that coming out of COVID that if we use that very well, then it would be actually uh, would be a force that is positive. If I regress one second in uh, the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, we missed a huge opportunity to address the issues. Uh, we spent a lot of money saving the banks, but we did not spend the money on right sizing or greening the economies. People felt that banks were too big to fail, people were too small to matter. This time, 
we're spending significantly more money, but we're already seeing a bigger part with the US infrastructure project, the European Green Deal, and many other things, a bigger part going to right sizing or right designing the global economies. And a lot of that spending goes to greening. The, um, so that is very encouraging. On the positive side, we've seen ESG explode. We've really seen the financial market waking up. We've seen also the countries in this world waking up uh, around climate change, the most burning issue. Uh, before um, COVID, about 20% of the countries had made climate commitments. Now it's 75%. We have all the G7 countries making commitments to be net zero by 2050, China 2060. And now we're accelerating that hopefully with 2030 commitments, which will be the focus of the COP26, where I'm working with the UK government advising them uh, on ensuring that we have a very ambitious COP26 in Glasgow at the end of the year. So there are some positive things and system changes that are happening now, I believe. We've also seen now with facts that companies that were operating under a multi-stakeholder longer term business model with purpose at the simply have better performed during the COVID crisis. They were already performing better, but that difference is even starker now. Uh, we've seen, uh, according to Just Capital, uh, who's looked at 1,000 Russell companies in the US, about a 30% better performance over the last four years. And these companies are obviously better positioned for that future that we're now designing to. A greener future versus a browner future, which, by the way, also creates more jobs, better jobs, and, and if we do it right, obviously a just transition that also would address the issues of inequality. Unfortunately, on inequality, I have to be a little bit less optimistic than what I'm telling you around climate change. We've seen less progress. We've all discovered the weaknesses in our social uh, safety networks, the informal workers, 1.6 billion still in this economy. Many more people pushed into poverty. We've lost about 500 uh, million equivalent jobs during this crisis and i'm very concerned about the social cohesion because if we don't address especially women and use the the job issues which are going to be crucial so are we able to do this recovery in a, a job generating way and here again the green economy restoring biodiversity retrofitting buildings moving to uh, electrifying our mobility systems etc are actually better job creators than the brown system not enough for what we need, but they're certainly better. So addressing this inequality and uh, job creation is, is certainly very high on the agenda. And there we need to do far more still than what we currently do. On climate change, we just now need to be sure that we hold everybody to the highest level of accountability uh, in the courts, uh, with governments, outside of the courts, with our own spending power, to be sure that we move not only in 2050, but actually in 2030. Uh, we, we need to cut by half in the next 10 years. Otherwise, we're not going to get there. And the good thing is that even the International Energy Agency, as you might have seen a few weeks ago, an agency that has always been a little bit, uh, call it, um, um, what is the right word, um, uh, complacent in terms of uh, climate change, probably more in the pockets of the fossil industry, has now finally come out and say it's by all means possible, but we need to start today. We need to stop investing in coal. We need to stop drilling for new sources of fossil fuel. And we need to accelerate the investments in green energy at a factor of five or six. Uh, you're seeing now, interestingly, technology that, that uh, has gone much faster than what we've ever thought before. That same International Energy Agency was saying in 2014, not long ago, that it would take to 2050 to have green energy at five cents per kilowatt hour. We've achieved the five cents per kilowatt hour in 2020. We've achieved that 36 years before, uh, sorry, 30 years before what they said before. So you see what technology is doing now, and hopefully that technology curve will continue to uh, excel. Uh, we see it happening now with green cars. There's a real acceleration now getting out of the uh, combustion engine. Most of the car manufacturers have now said by 2030, 2035, we won't sell anymore. Most of the cities have now said these cars are not entering the cities anymore. So we're at the cusp, I think, of major tipping points in some of our systems that we should celebrate. But then there are some sectors, the high abatement sectors like aluminum or steel or shipping or airlines, where we really need to have another dose of collective innovation and entrepreneurship to find the solutions to get us there. 
Thank you. Th thank you, Paul. Um, I think it'd be really great to hear from everyone in the public and uh, see what have inspired you uh, having heard having heard also Paul's personal story and and uh, and some of your really concrete suggestions of what needs to happen in the future. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna have a chance to hear from you all, and I'll pass it on to Erica, who's gonna explain how all of this will happen right now. Thank you, Santu. So yes, we're co slowly coming to the end of our session this morning. It's been really inspiring, really great. We're gonna do something called waterfall. So how it works is as it follows. So having heard Paul about his story, what actions has this conversation prompted in you? What are inspired to do differently? What are you ready to commit to? So think about it for a moment, write it in the chat, but don't press enter yet. When I say go, everyone will press enter at the same time and we'll see a waterfall of commitments, of actions, of new insights that this morning's live conversation has prompted in all of you. So go ahead, take a moment to write in the chat. Okay. <clears throat> so on the count of three, you press enter. One, two, three, waterfall. <laughs> wow, there's like a hundred messages coming. So let's <laughs> read a few of them. <laughs> but this is such get a, a feeling. <laughs> yes, Paul, you were gonna say something? No, I said, I don't envy you guys, but this is such an active group. It shows you why it's important you all get together and you show collective voice you know, there 20,000 uh, 16,000 of you across the world think about that energy coming together you move the world so we read compassion and connectedness local production dig where you stand influence where you are um, what else do we say trust compassion and leadership companies thrive by giving more than they take this is a quote from you and support others to become entrepreneurs. So I'll let you all continue reading to fill your day with inspiration and start this week on a very high note. I would like to very warmly thank you, Paul, for joining us this morning. Thank you to all of you members of the audience for taking the time to be together with us. I really feel the togetherness, even though we're scattered in different uh, geographical locations. I really feel that we're together here um, inspired and ready to do something different this week to accelerate this transition and really be the change that we wish to see. So thank you once again to everyone, to the team here for making this possible and uh, definitely get in touch and stay tuned. You know, pass, come to the Impact Hub Geneva and uh, stay tuned for information about the Entrepreneurship Academy. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Well, thank you, Santa and Erica. And for anybody who wants more ideas, buy the book Net Positive by Harvard Business Press. Thank you very much. And uh, have a lovely, have a lovely, lovely week ahead of you. Thanks, everybody. Yeah.